welcome to the DC Today. I feel like things are kind of normal now. It's an actual Monday. We have the longer form DC Today. It's a full uh, market week, you know, in terms of the calendar. And so through all the sort of abnormalities of the holiday season, it does feel like things are normalizing a bit. I'll start with a little reminder to ask you to subscribe to the podcast if that's what you want, if you want to receive the podcast regularly, as opposed to getting the email all the time and clicking to it. It does help us if you subscribe with your podcast player of choice. And uh, certainly if you're watching the video, it helps if you'll subscribe on YouTube or, and by the way, also throw a little thumbs up ranking deal there that, that uh, is beneficial for those numbers. But beyond that brief commercial, uh, it, was a weird, it was a weird day in markets, and, and you know, we've only been uh, open for five market days so far this year, and we've had quite a few weird ones. Um, the futures last night, uh, when they opened, as we're in the midst of all, you know, football and everything like that, they were up a bit, which was somewhat surprising after the massive rally day, over 700 points from Friday. And then futures actually continued to go up into the evening, and I believe by the time I went to bed last night, they were up. Uh, what was it? 82 points, 82 points when I went to bed. And uh, this morning up very early, they were up another hundred. So then the market opened up 150 or so and got up as much as 300 points. It closed down 112, the, but most of that was happening throughout the last, like let's call it two thirds of the day. You kind of had a rally early. It peaked um, before the day was a third done and then spent the rest of the day sliding down that hill with a few little, you know, blips and, and valleys along the way. Um, but again, you had a 450 point delta between the high point and the low point of the day. And on both up days and down days last week, we saw something similar so, so far this year, we're off to more volatility, more intraday volatility and, and whatnot. And uh, yet, I overall in the year, you know, markets are still modestly up. Today was a little unique, and I want to get these numbers exactly right for you. I mentioned the Dow was down a little over 100 points. The S&P was barely down, but the NASDAQ was up 0.6%. You had a big rally with a company you may have heard of called Tesla. It's been down a lot this year, but it's a big NASDAQ constituent. And it's of course a S&P constituent as well. But when you get one name like that, that uh, is of a $400 billion market cap, having a five or 6% up day, it drives a lot of indices. But in addition on the NASDAQ side, you had a huge day up in the chip sector. And um, so that was pulling a lot of the tech stuff up, even when a lot of other tech things weren't necessarily up. I even Fang for an a update on the NASDAQ, I think Fang had a kind of mixed bag, uh, three names up, two names down type of a thing. So um, what else do I want to highlight? Uh, on Friday's rally, there were seven advancers for every one decliner. That's pretty impressive breadth. Um, and the 10-year bond yield today closed at 3.53%. That is down four basis points on the day. So I think now it's four out of five days on the year that bonds have rallied. Today, again, being the same. Please don't be confused. We've had now, I think, two questions in the last three months that I answered in the Ask David section about this. But um, you need to just remember, when I refer to yields being down or the rate being down, that is a reflection of the bond prices being up that um, uh, bonds and yields, bond prices and bond yields trade inversely to one another. Um, today, the technology sector was up a little over 1%. The healthcare sector was down 1.6%. That was definitely the leading laggard. Okay, bigger picture, just two things I want to highlight today. Both came up in morning research. I think this is fascinating. It's a weird way to measure it, but I want you to get this lesson out of it. I don't need the glasses because I know the data by heart. The top quintile of companies returning cash with dividends versus the top quintile of companies returning cash with stock buybacks. It, the study also measured the top quintile with M&A, with debt pay down, with other things that one could do with cash. It's about cash use. And the top quintile, so you want to compare apples to apples, you could always compare the whole universe, but when you're looking at top quintile 
dividend return or uh, dividend grow payers, excuse me, versus stock buybacks. Last year, the um, dividend payers were down 2%. The stock buyback companies were down 13%, 133 uh, I think M&A was even down 14 And so, again, that's just within top quintile. Once you expand the universe, the numbers kind of change a bit. Uh, obviously, you know, if someone owned a dividend growth portfolio, hypothetically, that was up on the year, it would have been a byproduct of that stock picking and perhaps energy weighting. Uh, you know, there's a number of other factors that could play in, but I'm just isolating a few here. So the um, way in which cash has been returned to shareholders uh, in a bad market, ha and we're not talking about dividend growth, we're just talking about dividend payers, we're talking about div uh, stock buybacks, uh, M&A, debt pay down, by, far and away, by a major factor, the uh, dividend payers were the best performers when you do apples to apples comparison. The other piece then um, that I want to highlight talks about revenue growth in the S&P, and, and there's a little update to some numbers. Uh, we are expecting, but from analyst estimates and consensus forecasts, revenue growth to the upside in every S&P sector this year besides utilities, which is expecting a pretty meaningful drop down for a number of reasons, and then materials, which is expecting um, a, a bit of a revenue drop as well. Technology is technically forecasted in aggregate to have um, a drop, but it's like 0.8%. So kind of flat revenues expected in tech, pretty good size revenue drop in utilities, materials, and then the rest of the um, market is expecting uh, revenue growth. Okay, but here's the thing. It's that margins are expected uh, to grow, to expand this year. And that's really where you get overall profit expectations where they currently are relative to where revenue expectations are. So in my opinion, if, if earnings, if profit expectations starts being revised downward, I think it's far more likely going to be because revenues um, disappoint than the margin side of things. And so as revenues go, it's very likely that that's where profits will go, but we'll we'll you know keep an eye on it. And of course, you could have a very uh, divergent response from one sector to the next. Uh, on the news side, we know now that uh, as a very late Friday night, um, Kevin McCarthy was in fact elected Speaker of the House. It was the fifteenth ballot attempt. You know, a lot of history be made last last week. I'm not going to go into my political commentary on it now because I don't think that's what this is for. I don't think a lot of people care. Um, uh, I've kind of gone back and forth on a few things. There's some parts of the way it played out that I'm really pleased with and some parts that I think a lot of people, myself included, are embarrassed by. But um, the one thing I'll say is that it's the, I think it's August where the debt debate, the debt ceiling debate will, will reach its crescendo. And I, I'm not expecting good things out of that. I'll write more on it in the near, near term, plus, of course, throughout the months ahead. Um, on the policy front, the rules package is being voted on tonight. That will govern kind of house operations. I don't think m many care about like how they go about electing people to certain committees and what the numerical breakdowns are. Some of the kind of bureaucratic and procedural elements of this rules package, I, I doubt are very important to markets. But what is in there or has been committed to be in there is some form of committing to hold 2022 um, budget levels in line for I think 10 years, which implies uh, this time without some other knobs being turned, a pretty meaningful uh, likelihood of, of cuts in defense spending. So you not only could get some political action around how they pass it through, but then you know anything that is ongoing, uh, uh, for, again, for a, you know, indebtedness hawk like me, I don't mind anything that can kind of limit it, but but this could very well be a little less stabilizing of a way of doing it than, than the kind of legislative intent. Um, on the economic front, the jobs data is what drove markets up on Friday, and you got a real good chance to see the kind of just moronic reality of what people are trying to do in trading some of this the BLS jobs data came in at 223,000 for December. That was a little more than expected, 205,000. 
And then futures came down thinking, oh, no, this is good news. And then that's bad because it's going to cause the Fed, you know, the whole thing. And I, I'm now going to just shorthand. I kind of abbreviate when I explain it because I'm so sick of it. But I do think people listening right now know what I'm talking about. But then the bad news um, in the jobs number became good news because underneath the hood, first of all, the bad news of really good job growth last month turned out to be a little less than people expected because there was some downward revision from the prior month. But more importantly, under the hood, wage growth was much less than had been expected. Now in the month, it was only a little less than expected. But when you go to a further timeline, I believe wage growth in March was at 5.6%. And, and in, as of this December's number, it come all the way down to 4.6% year over year wage growth. So that's quite a meaningful move lower. Um, Overall, what I think markets did is say, okay, this jobs report wasn't on fire. And in fact, there is a little hair on some of the things inside of it. And uh, so it, it kind of reinforced a Fed pause phase. Um, right now, Fed futures are looking at 77% chance at the next Fed meeting of just a quarter point rate hike and a 23% chance of a half a point rate hike. So, uh, you know, it looks like the market's expecting another rate hike and, and a very modest one. And, you know, once you go from 75, 75, 75 to, to 50 and you go to 25, you, you really set yourself up to be able to go into a pause. Um, there, I would encourage you to look at the dctoday.com today for a chart we've put in uh, in the Fed section something called the proxy rate. An analyst I follow a lot named Sam Rines at Corbu talks about this a bunch. And I'm becoming a bit more intrigued with the way it's actually generated by the San Francisco um, Fed that uh, their policy effective rate, um, what they call a kind of proxy rate, that they're taking the Fed funds rate, which is right now four and a quarter, and adding in a measured effect. There's a model around it of things like the balance sheet tightening um, and other financial conditions with mortgage rates, with, with spreads, treasuries, what have you. And, and really at the end of the day, um, they're saying that they think the effective rate when you factor in forward guidance in the balance sheet is 6%. And that this isn't people like me or Sam saying it, and it's the Fed saying it about their own policy, okay? And I think that really does speak to um, the argument for why I believe they're they're getting much closer to pause than some had thought. Uh, oil and energy, um, you're still not at 700, you're still 700,000 rather below pre-pandemic levels. It's a big story. U.S. production still not back to pre-COVID levels. Demand is back to pre-COVID. And yet then prices sitting in the 70s, a byproduct of massive strategic petroleum reserve drawdown, and then the Department of Energy was set to buy back a little bit, not very much. How much was it? I think it was 3 million barrels. Is that right? Yeah, it sure is. 3 million barrels that they were going to buy back over the weekend, and then they canceled it. They, they dropped the order. And uh, I believe that they may be because they want to get a lower price, and we're sitting here today at $75. I don't know. Maybe. I mean, who knows, you know? But it's very possible that they're going to wish that they were filling up strategic petroleum reserve in the 70s uh, very soon. Uh, China reopening is a big part of that. But, but we'll, we'll see. It's not, it's not something I want to bet my life on. So check out the Ask David section against doomsdayism. Get a little bit more information at the Written DC Today. I do want to leave it there. We're going to do our podcast and video Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday this week. The abridged market summary in the written DC today, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And then on Friday, I'm going to be doing a special dividend cafe on Bernie Madoff, a name that uh, was, you know, one of the major financial stories at late 2008 going into 2009 that represented one of the great uh, Ponzi schemes in history, the largest Ponzi scheme in history. Um, and, and now is back in the news because Netflix has a four part series on it. I watched it over the weekend and then got inspired, and that's what Dividend Cafe is going to be dealing with. But it's not really going to be that much about Bernie. 
It's going to be about, um, let's, let's just say, a derivative investment lesson that all of us can learn out of the Bernie moment. And I'll, uh, I'll bring that to you on Friday in the Dividend Cafe. CPI comes Thursday. I'll keep you posted on other things Tuesday, Wednesday. Thanks for listening to, watching, and reading the DC Today.